Hello, everyone. Welcome to 2023 and episode number 513 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. My friends, it's that time of year again when I get absolutely buried in press releases. I could post news all day on eejournal.com about CES and still have a whole bunch more to post. (laughs) So, are we talking about the newest and greatest consumer electronics today? Nope, absolutely not. Because, like me, I figure you have a whole lot of other opportunities to listen about CES. So... Let's talk about quantum computing today. My guest is Dr. Eric Garcel of Classic, and we're talking about how Classic is shaking up the quantum computing industry with a revolutionary new way to create quantum algorithms. We also discuss why Eric believes that IP protection is crucial to the development and evolution of quantum computing, and why today is a perfect time to jumpstart your quantum computing journey. So without further ado, please welcome Eric to Fish Fry. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. How's it going? Fantastic. How about yourself? Having a great day. Excellent. Okay, so first off, for my audience who may not know, what is Classic all about? All right. Well, Classic is a software development platform for quantum computers. And what we're doing is abstracting out the layer of programming quantum computers. Right now, the standard date is programming at the assembly language. And if you've ever programmed at the assembly language, you know that that's not quite a tenable thing as we start getting to larger and larger computing power. And certainly with IBM's new uh, chip technology they announced that's publicly available on the cloud, there's a 433 qubit chip we can start using. Doing that at the assembly language is going to take a hot minute if you try and do it that way. In the same way that classical computers moved from doing things at the assembly language to these higher level dynamic languages for the design of, you know, transistors on chips. Certainly we're not doing that by hand anymore, right? We have these higher level abstracted languages. We're doing the same for quantum. Now we have a quantum dynamic language where you can describe out what you want that circuit architecture to do and the system will generate the architecture for you. So uh, kind of lowering that barrier to entry, making things a lot easier to do, you know, scalable programs, terribly important as we start scaling in hardware. So, Eric, quantum computing is a big topic in the world of electronic engineering today. Mm -hmm. But I think there is still a lot of my engineering audience that doesn't quite know when and how to start. So when do you think would be the perfect time to get started in this realm and why? Honestly, my answer has always been now. Quantum is a fast emerging field. I get asked by both engineers and business individuals when I should start. My answer is always similar to, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, the best time to plant a tree was probably a few years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. So let's get started learning and growing in this journey. Certainly, there are a number of companies already investigating quantum in big ways. And as an engineer, it's a great time to start gaining those skills, learning it, and it's going to help you in the future every step of the way, right? If you have one year of experience programming a quantum computer or having that background, you're an expert in the field. The field hasn't been around for long enough for anybody to ask for like 10 years of C++ experience. One year and you are the the expert in the room. So it's really an excellent time to be going in, especially as the industry is growing. That makes sense. Now, Eric, what kind of skills do you believe are needed to develop quantum computing? Thankfully, it's getting easier to enter the field. There's quite a bit of foundational knowledge you have to have to get in at this assembly language stage. But as we're abstracting out the layer of programming, it's getting a lot easier to enter the field and start programming and start getting valuable results from quantum systems. So really what you have to have getting into it is a thirst to learn, right? If you're already an electrical engineer, probably already know how to program in Python, right? So we're not learning anything new, any kind of new uh, languages fundamentally. It's just uh, what are the kind of algorithms I'm calling out. What do they do? When will I want to use them? And thankfully, with these, you know, abstracted languages, you don't have to fundamentally understand quantum mechanics to start getting into the field. You just have to know the functions that you're calling and why you would want to use them and what they're good for. Let's talk specifically about the issues surrounding 
quantum IP. Why do you think it's important to protect quantum IP? And what are the consequences of missing out on developing this IP? Well, I'm a big advocate for protecting IP in general, right? It's the same story for any kind of new and emerging technology, right? This cool new technology is coming out. As it's coming out, we're starting to see applications that are going to have business value. It's really important for businesses to start leveraging the internal intellectual property. Like, let's start learning this as a company, you know, as your division, start building up those skunk work teams to start getting that fundamental understanding. But, but then once you know where your company can take advantage of quantum, start patenting quantum applications. Now, you have the same problem with quantum programming as you would classical programming. You can't patent the software, but you can go for a patent for the applications, the process of taking advantage of this. So it's terribly important to protect this because uh, most of the major analysts in the field say that most certainly there is gonna be major quantum business value generated from this field within the next 10 years. Where in that 10 years, the analysts you know, all have different answers, but patents last 20 years. So if you want to take advantage of quantum, companies are patenting today on quantum applications so that when this quantum advantage happens, when they can start extracting significant value from this, they can start operating and patent fencing out their competition. That's a big one. You know, companies, whether or not they want to take advantage of quantum, are patenting today to make sure their competitors can't. There's an interesting kind of a patent battle going on in the background on who's going to, you know, patent certain algorithms or certain processes. It's quite interesting. Absolutely. So, I saw you guys recently collaborated with Rolls-Royce. So tell me about this collaboration. And this had to do with fluid dynamics algorithms, right? Yep, computational fluid dynamics. So we're working with their aerospace division from Rolls-Royce. Fluid dynamics in physics can also mean, you know, gases. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, right? Avionics and gases are terribly important to simulate this. How do we save on energy? How do we make these things more efficient? And these calculations are very computationally intensive, right? There's a lot of mathematical numerical simulation going on in the background that we're using supercomputers to go ahead and do, but it's taking quite a bit of time to simulate it. So what Rolls-Royce wants to do is shorten up the amount of time it takes to do these kinds of simulations. And they're looking at using quantum in a hybrid approach. That's how most quantum will be used in the future going to be hybrid in the same way that, uh, you know, some programmers use CPUs for certain algorithms. They'll send it, you know, certain algorithms to the GPU. We'll have QPUs in the future. And that's going to be a new resource that is going to be really efficient for certain types of problems and certainly won't solve everything, but great new resource that was going to speed up quite a few different types of calculations. And Rolls-Royce is looking at solving uh, linear systems of equations using quantum computing. It's been proven out to be quite useful in this degree. I believe the algorithm is called HHL, is the algorithm you'd use for quantum to solve linear system of equations. So they're looking at using these quantum systems for the linear equations, and then for the uh, using the classical computer for the nonlinear equations, and then putting them together for your final simulation. And hopefully, by uh, using both of these resources and you know sending the right task to the most efficient type of processor they can speed up these simulations. That's super cool. All right. Well, Eric, I think it's time for your off the cuff question. <laughs> All right. Now, I was going to ask you about food, but then we got on this call and I noticed you have a super fabulous mustache. So <laughs> Thank you. tell my audience a little bit about it and why you decided to have such a structurally awesome mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a, a quite a fun curly mustache. It started I've always been a big fan of Salvador Dali, and I've loved his art. I've loved kind of the, the history of the fellow. And, you know, one year for Halloween, I thought, you know, I'm going to grow up my mustache. I'm going to do this. It's going to be fun. It was a pain to grow out. But once I had it, it was quite fun and entertaining. And I ended up liking it so much, I decided to keep it for a while and say, you know, let, let's see how this goes. And funnily enough, I went to kind of two conferences that happened uh, in, in short order between each other, a few months apart. And... If someone didn't remember my name at that second conference, they said, you know, I, I can't remember your name, but I sure as heck remember that mustache. And we we had a conversation, didn't we? <laughs> so it, it's actually been quite useful professionally. It's almost a, a little bit of self-branding at this point. <laughs> I love it. And yes, I will absolutely remember you 
by your mustache, even not meeting you in person. <laughs> so Wonderful. fantastic. Well, Eric, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have you heard about chat GPT? Yeah, it wrote this script. Okay, that's not true. But I have heard almost more about ChatGPT or GPT-3 over the last couple weeks than CES. Almost. But have you heard that GPT-3 could be used to help detect Alzheimer's disease in its earliest stages? Yeah, so get this. A team of researchers from Drexel University's School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems recently revealed a study that showed that OpenAI's GPT-3 program was able to predict early stages of dementia with an accuracy rate of 80% by identifying clues from spontaneous speech. So, at the heart of this study is an investigation into the effectiveness of natural language processing programs for the early detection of Alzheimer's, and how language impairment can be an early indicator of neurodegenerative disorders. So, how do we diagnose Alzheimer's today? Well, it normally involves a thorough medical review and a whole lot of neurological and physical evaluations and tests. There is no cure for this disease right now. But language impairment can be an important symptom to track, since somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of dementia patients suffer from it. But there is a nuance here that is important to point out. Researchers have been focusing lately on more subtle clues, like making grammar and pronunciation mistakes, forgetting the meaning of words, or even hesitation in speech patterns to indicate earlier stages of dementia. Walu Liang, PhD, a professor in Drexel School of Biomedical Engineering Science and Health Systems, and a co-author of this research, explains the motivation of this study like this. We know from ongoing research that the cognitive effects of Alzheimer's disease can manifest themselves in language production. The most commonly used tests for early detection of Alzheimer's look at acoustic features, such as pausing, articulation, and vocal quality, in addition to tests of cognition. But we believe the improvement of natural language processing programs provide another path to support early identification of Alzheimer's. So how does chat GPT or GPT-3 come in here exactly? Well, first, as I'm sure you all know at this point, GPT-3 is capable of generating human-like text. It can do a wide range of language-based applications like translation, language modeling, and generating text for applications such as chatbots. With GPT-3, there is a particular focus on how words are used and how language is constructed. And as you probably already know, its training allows GPT-3 to produce human-like responses, including answers to simple questions, to writing poems or essays. So, could GPT-3 be adapted to recognize those early dementia speech patterns I mentioned earlier? This team from Drexel thinks so. They say, GPT-3's systemic approach to language analysis and production make it a promising candidate for identifying the subtle speech characteristics that, that may predict the onset of dementia. Training GPT-3 with a massive data set of interviews, some of which are Alzheimer's patients, could provide it with the information it needs to extract speech patterns that could then be applied to identifying markers in future patients. So, how did they test this theory? Well, they ended up creating a Alzheimer's screening machine of sorts. 
First, they trained GPT-3 with a set of transcripts from a portion of a data set of speech recordings compiled with the support of the National Institutes of Health, specifically for the purpose of testing natural language processing programs ability to predict dementia. And then this program was able to capture meaningful characteristics of the word use, sentence structure, and meaning from the text to create what this team of researchers refer to as an embedding or a characteristic profile of Alzheimer's speech. And then they actually use this embedding to retrain the program, thereby developing an Alzheimer's screening machine. To test it even further, they then asked the program to examine many other transcripts from that data sheet to conclude whether or not each one was produced by someone who was developing Alzheimer's. And the results? GPT-3 did quite well. This team from Drexel explains the success of their study like this. They say, our results demonstrate that the text embedding generated by GPT-3 can be reliably used not only to detect individuals with Alzheimer disease from healthy controls, but also infer the subject's cognitive testing score, both solely based on speech data. We further show that text embedding outperforms the conventional acoustic feature-based approach and even performs competitively with fine-tuned models. These results altogether suggest that GPT-3-based text embedding is a promising approach for AD assessment and has the potential to improve early diagnosis of dementia. Wow. So I'm not sure if you've experienced Alzheimer's or any other forms of dementia personally, but I have. I saw Alzheimer's slowly dissolve my grandmother from one of the fiercest women on the planet to a shell of her former self. So it's not a cure, but maybe it's a start. So if you want to check out even more information about this study, of course, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish fry and page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fry and page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of January 6th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>